Okay, so now on to the main event. Um, so David uh, Abel uh, is our keynote speaker. I'm thrilled to introduce David. I actually, as I mentioned to him uh, earlier, I saw him speak uh, about six months ago. Um, really, really amazing, super knowledgeable guy and really looking forward to his uh, speech tonight. So David is an award-winning reporter, uh, currently covers the environment for the Boston Globe. Uh, his career as a reporter at the Globe, uh, where he's been since 1999, David has covered the war in the Balkans, unrest in Latin America, national security issues in DC, terrorism in New York and Boston, uh, and climate change and poverty in New England. David is also a documentary filmmaker and an occasional professor of journalism, was part of the team that won the 2014 Pulitzer uh, for the paper's coverage of the Boston Marathon bombings. So really pleased to introduce David. Could you, where's David? Oh, there he is, hey, okay. So I'll trade places with you. Thanks, David Abel. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, thank you all for having me here. I, um, I, I want to say how much I absolutely love the Blue Hills. I live uh, not far in Boston in Jamaica Plain and I remember when I first moved to the city, I was just amazed that there is this incredibly uh, beautiful, uh, rustic place just, uh, just next to the city. And since I had kids, it's just been a refuge, especially this year during the pandemic over the past year and a half. Um, so thank you all for uh, what you do to maintain uh, this incredibly beautiful place. Uh, as a uh, user and admirer, um, I'm grateful. So uh, thank you and thank you for inviting me. So with that, I, um, I will launch into what I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience and uh, as a reporter, and then uh, I'll talk about some of my work and, and my work involving climate change. Over the past decade in pursuit of stories as the Boston Globe's environment reporter, I've walked atop nuclear reactors, boarded ice-covered fishing boats before dawn, and crossed the melting Arctic Sea on a snowmobile. I've covered the aftermath of horrific natural disasters, such as the leveling of much of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands after hurricanes Maria and Irma. I reported in maximum security prisons, trekked across the mountains of Tierra del Fuego, and most recently fished with rogue lobstermen in Nova Scotia and paddled through rivers polluted with to toxic chemicals right here in Boston. Over the years, I've had a front row seat to many of the rapid changes we've been experiencing in our climate, in our environment, and in our energy systems. Frankly, these days, very little surprises me. But two and a half years ago, I read a United Nations report that floored me and left me struggling to comprehend the enormity of its findings. It found that as many as a million plant species and animal species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. The report, which was produced by hundreds of scientists around the world, found that the average abundance of native plants and animals in the rainforest in South America and the savannas in Africa and other world, uh, major world uh, land habitats had plummeted already at least 20% just in the past century. It projected that more than 40% of all amphibian species, more than a third of all marine mammals, and a third of reef-forming corals are now at risk of extinction. In an interview, one of the uh, authors of the report put it this way to me. It's like 
were unraveling our life support system. He said, noting that the loss of so much biodiversity would have a grave impact on food supplies, medicines, air quality, and much more. Another author of the report called the findings ominous. We're eroding the very foundations of our economies, livelihoods, food security, health, and quality of life worldwide, he told me. I wrote a story about the report that appeared on the front page of the Boston Globe the next day, but it didn't quite feel sufficient. It didn't feel like it conveyed the full gravity or the scale of these findings. That story stuck with me and I began to wonder, how do you possibly get anyone to appreciate such an overwhelming magnitude of loss? How could I help folks as a journalist understand that climate change, the ultimate cause of all this destruction to our biodiversity was not some distant abstract threat, but one that presents a clear and present danger right now. Before I knew anything about climate change, before I became a journalist or knew what I wanted to do with my life, I was out of college, I was just out of college, I was broke, and I was a kind of vagabond searching for identity on the streets of San Francisco where I had just moved. One day, between reading my inscrutable poems at poetry readings and struggling with an overwrought novel, I learned that a Russian political figure by the name of Vladimir Zhirinovsky, who many thought was going to become the next leader of Russia, had come to town to speak. I didn't have much better to do, so I decided I would check it out. After his speech, which was filled with virulent bombast, I watched a shaggy haired man in an old blazer with elbow patches get up to ask a question. He called out Jiranovsky for his violent rhetoric and asked questions that made him squirm. He was a reporter for the local newspaper. Around the same time, I was reading a novel called Immortality by the great Czech writer Milan Kundera. Kundera described what he called the 11th commandment, a right allowed to journalists in democratic countries, or what he called the right to demand an answer to a question. He wrote, the journalist is not merely the one who asks questions, but the one who has the sacred right to ask to anyone about anything. He called the question a bridge of understanding reaching out from one human to another. That power, a kind of means to empathy and holding public officials accountable really resonated with me. I started volunteering to write for a local newspaper a few months later, I moved to Chicago for a master's program in journalism, where I learned how to ground prose and write in short to the point sentences that aimed to be anything but inscrutable, um, which was anything like my poetry at the time. At the end of the program, in which I spent a few months interning as a Washington correspondent for a newspaper in Mexico City, I moved there for my first paying position at a newspaper. On my first day in Mexico, I got a quick lesson in the stresses of the job. A paunchy editor who favored cigars and scotch for breakfast gave me my first assignment. In a monotone growl and a swirl of smoke, he asked me to translate a story from Spanish into English, an assignment I was uniquely unqualified for given that I was going on the high school Spanish that I had. Before moving to Mexico, incidentally, this editor assured me that that would just be fine and that would get me by at least in the beginning. So I spent the next hour bent over a Spanish-English dictionary. I knew something was wrong 
when the lead of my story read something like, a frog in a rainbow on Saturday morning planned to appoint an airplane as the nation's next attorney general. <laughs> the, the sweat began to drip down my increasingly warm forehead. If there was one lesson I had picked up while studying journalism in graduate school, one tenet of the craft that seemed to rise above all the others, it was that what you write has to be true, that, that facts matter. I began to feel dizzy. My computer seemed to be rocking back and forth as did the cement building where I was sitting on the third floor. I was sure I was having a nervous breakdown. It was about that moment I noticed many of my colleagues were running for the door and that someone was tapping me on the shoulder, urging me to follow her right away. It turned out a major earthquake had struck Mexico City and I was too stressed out to realize it. As more seasoned colleagues sprang into action, I was just relieved I was able to get out of that assignment. I spent about a year learning the ropes of journalism in Mexico, which sometimes felt like a post-apocalyptic hellscape given all of the pollution there. I left Mexico to spend a few months running a pepper farm in a small mountain town in the Dominican Republic, but that's a long story. Afterward, I moved to South Florida where I was hired to cover a small community on the edge of the Everglades, where I learned how human beings could radically transform such a wild landscape, turning alligator-filled swamps into strip malls. After a year, I was impatient to get back to Latin America, and when the then Pope John Paul II visited Cuba in the late 90s, it seemed there was an opening to do what I really wanted to do as a reporter. That is, to give voice to the voiceless, to expose inequities, to shed light on the effects of authoritarianism in which no one has freedom of speech, people go to prison for criticizing the government, and poverty and despair were more pervasive than I had seen anywhere else. Over the next six months as a stringer for the Boston Globe, Miami Herald, and other papers, I pushed my luck writing increasingly critical stories about everything from dissident farmers to independent libraries. Eventually, the government had enough of my presence and summarily deported me. Over the next year, I moved to Washington, DC, uh, as Matt mentioned, and I covered national security issues at the Pentagon and went to the former Yugoslavia to cover the war over Kosovo. The Globe eventually asked me to move to Boston to become a staff writer. It was an opportunity to have some financial stability after years of freelancing, and I looked forward to working for a great paper full time. Since then, I've written thousands of stories for the Boston Globe, covering academia, poverty, terrorism, racism, and of course, most recently, a pandemic. I've been fortunate also to be able to moonlight as a travel writer with datelines from places like Bolivia to Zambia. I've had the opportunity to interview heroes of mine, such as Kurt Vonnegut uh, and the poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and write stories about giants such as Stephen Hawking and Noam Chomsky. I've also covered some of the major stories of our time, including the deadlock election in 2000 uh, in Florida, the attacks on September 11th in New York and the terrorism uh, many of us experienced here in Boston uh, at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. But no story has threaded through my career or frankly been as important to me as how our environment has been changing and the impact it's having across the planet. The first story in which I mentioned climate change or what uh, we often called back then global warming for the globe was in 2001, little more than a year after I started at the paper. It was a story I wrote shortly after Al Gore conceded to George W. Bush when the Supreme Court stopped the recount in Florida. The story was about how Gore left politics 
and was teaching at Columbia University. After rereading the story, I realized that something had stuck with me from that piece. I remember Gore talking to his students about balance, or more specifically, false balance. Here's what I wrote back then. In the name of balance, the new professor told his students that journalism's, journalists shouldn't give credit to discredited ideas. In writing a story about AIDS, for example, it's necessary to include, is it necessary to include someone questioning whether HIV produces AIDS, even though some still say it doesn't, Gore asked his students. More than a decade later, when I took over the environment beat at the Globe, I came to learn quickly that there really wasn't much of a sincere debate about whether humans were causing the planet to warm. And over time, I realized that part of my mission as the Globe's environment reporter was to reflect to readers that climate change was not some ideological point of view, not some, as I said, distant abstract idea, but that it was a fact and to point out, and that it was part of my job to point out that evidence of things like warming temperatures, rising tides, strengthening storms, growing droughts, and much more. But it was also to show how the evidence was starting to become apparent everywhere, including here in New England. And that it, if we didn't take this issue seriously, our world would change in irrevocable ways that would eventually, uh, and sadly, perhaps by the end of this century and in uh, some of our lives and our children's lives, make parts of this planet uninhabitable. My beat at the paper has extended beyond climate change. This involved writing about polluted rivers and soot in our air, toxic chemicals and gas leaks, overfishing, lead poisoning, unhealthy drinking water, our energy challenges and transportation woes, and of course, the biodiversity crisis, which has been called the sixth mass, mass extinction. My stories in the globe have sought to cast light on many of these issues while holding government officials and other institutions to account. That has meant sometimes ruffling feathers, even of those who've been spent years working to protect the environment. In New England, climate change so far has had the most pronounced impact on our oceans, especially the Gulf of Maine, which is warming faster than just about any other body of water on the planet. That warming has already had a major impact on our marine ecosystem. It has also had a major impact on our commercial fishing industry which until recently employed about 83,000 people and generated more than $4 billion. And that's just here in Massachusetts. Those effects have been especially visible on some of our iconic species, such as cod, lobster, and whales. I've written many stories about these issues for the paper, but over the years, as we've become less of a print publication and more of a multimedia operation, I've come to learn about the power of telling stories in different ways. At first, I was given something called a flip video camera, which is this pocket-sized device with a minuscule screen. You had to get close enough to the subjects uh, and the images, you had to get very close to the subjects, but the images and the audio were still awful. This was the predecessor to cell phones. But still, I was able to get a sense from what, what you could harness by telling stories in this very different medium, one that I long had a prejudice against as a print reporter. Uh, uh, we, we tend to look down on, on TV news, and I was very skeptical about this. But I came to see how video could supplement what I was trying to do as a writer. And then after spending a good amount of time learning how to use uh, 
um, a video camera and telling stories in this medium, on April 15th, 2013, while I was on leave from the Globe doing a fellowship for journalists at Harvard where I began to study documentary filmmaking, I was standing on the finish line of the Boston Marathon working on a class project and holding a video camera that I was still learning how to use. It was a beautiful day and it was just a really powerful thing to be right there um, watching all of these people cheer for other people, strangers cheering on other strangers, which for me was the most basic act of love. When all of a sudden, about 15 steps from where I was standing, the first bomb exploded. And then the next one did. I, if you've seen any of the footage from the aftermath of the bombings, you've probably seen my footage. Um, that moment had a deep impact on my life and also on my career. And it led to my first feature film, which I called Undaunted, um, in which I also, again, nearly died the next year while carrying a camera the full length of the marathon. After that year, I returned to covering the environment and made my first environmental film about how overfishing and climate change led to the collapse of the cod industry in New England, which is America's oldest fishery. We called that film Sacred Cod. Um, we're running out of time and I wanted to show you a few trailers. Uh, this one's short, so I'll, I'll show you this quick one if uh, Jay can pull it up. Um, uh, but this was uh, my first uh, featured film um, that looked at how the federal government did something that was unthinkable in a region that arguably was built by cod. Uh, and cod are what arguably uh, attracted settlers from Europe and made New England what it is. And we called the film Sacred Cod uh, because hanging from the rafters of the state house is this wooden a uh, wooden sculpture called the Sacred Cod. And here is just uh, a short uh, uh, sense of what this film uh, went on to do. Something's at three to four percent. It's it's time to worry. We really are one of the fastest warming places on the planet right now. I'm not sure if this will play. The Gulf of Maine does not give up her secrets very easily. We can move on. Um, after Sacred Cod, I made another film about. A lot of things to be learned in this business. Which one of the most important ones? Don't trust the government. I've hung on to a, a belief, a way of life. I just wanted to give my family a little more than what I had. Maybe you've got to fire some of your employees, just like hundreds of fishermen have been fired. There was probably 45 people who worked here. Today, we have seven. And this is what science misses on. So this really becomes a community loss. The bottoms of these breeding grounds have become virtual deserts. There's no more cod on Cape Cod. The last ice man of Gloucester. Levels are pretty high. From the wharfs, to the fish deals, to the truckers, to the supermarkets, to our church churches that are friggin' empty now. It's the death of a way of life. So after this film, um, I continued to make films about climate change. Um, and um, I returned to Florida uh, to make a film about the federal government's $16 billion effort to restore the Everglades, one of the planet's most damaged ecosystems, and about the impact of rising seas. We called that film Gladesman, The Last of the Sawgrass Cowboys. You just sort of show the title page if you want, Jay. Um, uh, it's up. Yeah. Um, 
to give a sense, you don't have to show it. Um, and after afterward, I made another film uh, also about climate change titled Lobster War, which was about how the warming waters in the Gulf of Maine led to a surge in the lobster catch in a patch of water known as the gray zone between down east Maine and Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia, which both the United States and Canada have claimed since the end of the Revolutionary War. The rising catch there led to a conflict between fishermen from both countries. After spending a lot of time with lobstermen, I learned about their impact on endangered whales, and that led me to start thinking about how I may, might make sense of that chilling United Nations report that estimated we were likely to lose a million species by the end of the century. I began to think it might be easier for people to, to comprehend such a huge loss if I could tell the story through one species, an iconic one that people might be more likely to identify with, like a whale. So that's what led me to my most recent film entitled Entangled, which is about how climate change has accelerated a collision between one of the world's most endangered species, North America's most valuable fishery, and a federal agency mandated to protect both. The film chronicles the efforts to protect North Atlantic right whales from extinction, the impacts of those efforts on the lobster industry, and how the National Marine Fisheries Service has struggled to balance the vying interests. Ultimately, the goal of this film is to do what I've been trying to do with my journalism, which is to show the complicated challenges that we are growing, uh, that, that are growing and that we are more likely to face as the planet warms and we lose biodiversity and policymakers have to thread the needle between vital commercial and conservation interests. So I, I would end by trying to show uh, a little bit of the trailer of this one too. Um, so hopefully we'll let this play until it doesn't. whale is an extraordinary creature. It's really one of the wonders of the living world. But if something in our management doesn't change, the direction of the population points to zero, and that's extinction. The North Atlantic right whale is considered one of the most endangered species on the planet. This will be the first large whale in modern history that would go extinct. Eighty-five percent of the right whale population now bears scars that indicate an entanglement injury. This was a big problem, and it's an urgent problem. It's a tragedy that we're losing the right whales. It's emblematic of large-scale changes that are happening on the planet. Human beings can exist without biodiversity, and this is maybe a harbinger of where we're going. We need to put as much pressure as we can on the agency to step up and take action right now. I don't think the urgency can be overstated. Human action is killing these whales, and human action has the ability to save them. Lobstermen are stewards of the sea, and they don't want to entangle anything. I sat here and listened to environmentalist after environmentalist tell me what a murderous individual I am. My opinion about the whales is fuck them. What more can we do? 
eventually they're going to die off. It's going to happen no matter what. As your governor, I will do everything I can to defend Maine's lobster industry in the face of this absurd federal overreach. The challenge is to find ways for the fishing industry and the right whales to coexist in the same waters. NOAA is the fox scouting the chicken coop. You're going to be fired for being a liar and a person who works to kill off the right whale. One of the problems is that fisheries are one of the main factors that are endangering protected species. You end up with one organisation deeply conflicted with its mission. Hi everybody, I hope you can hear me and I hope you were able to hear my talk. Um, doesn't look like anybody's on video, but we've got one question, which is here. And you in the Globe devote a daily column to the climate emergency. Uh, well, as it happens, the Boston Globe has just, ho hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, uh, yep, they say yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, it's a little awkward because I'm looking this way, but the computer's that way. So uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, so uh, the Globe, as it happens, has just started a new climate team, of which I'm a member, and we are expanding our climate coverage significantly. So uh, you, you've already seen um, in recent months a, a, a more focused and concerted effort to cover climate change. And I think you will see uh, even more of that in the coming weeks, months, and years. Um, Sarah Freeman has a question. Sarah, are, are you able to unmute yourself and ask a question? No, I don't think I had a question. Did oh, it? so sorry. <laughs> was it that you saw maybe? Oh, no, I thought it was Sarah. Oh, sorry. we thought it was, was you, Sarah. Sarah. Did someone else raise their hand for a question? You can go ahead and unmute and ask it. Um, there is a question in the chat from another David. Um, in your years of making these films and writing stories, what surprised you the most? Um, it's, it's a hard question to answer because, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, that after uh, many years as a reporter, there's not that much that surprises you. Uh, I think, though, some of the um, some of the statistics about the potential impacts of climate change if we do not reduce our emissions and alter tra the trajectory of our path uh, are shocking and uh, and really deeply frightening. Um, and reading about uh, the amount of damage or carnage that could come from uh, two, three, even four degrees Celsius of warming uh, is, um, is constantly eye-opening and jaw-dropping. Are there other questions from the group on Zoom? Sarah, go ahead. I changed my mind. I arrived late, so I'm sorry I didn't hear all the comments, but I'm glad to hear that the globe is expanding their coverage on the climate issue. And I wonder if, whoops, if you have any insight on some, on the film, like the conflicts between the lobster people and, and the whales, or it seems unfortunately that so many climate related issues become tug of wars, whether it's motorists not wanting to give up space for bicyclists or uh, developers wanting to cut down trees. It's like, how do you um, communicate in a way that it is not a tug of war, but rather we're all in this boat together and how do we work together in a, a balanced way? Um, thank you for that question, Sarah. It's a good question. Um, you know, some journalism uh, is uh, impugned for focusing on conflict at the expense of solutions. Um, and there may be some truth to that. Uh, what we try to do, though, is to highlight uh, the challenges uh, and not 
uh, just prettify things and to just uh, write things in a bone homey kind of way. Uh, but to, we, we try to um, unveil the reality uh, and the hard truths. And sometimes those aren't pretty and they involve conflict. Uh, and there are uh, unfortunately great rifts over how to address climate change uh, and uh, what we do. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to, uh, as journalists in our perch, to, to cast light on those issues and how they stymie efforts to, to address what we uh, as a society uh, and a globe need to do in terms of bending the curve of, of our emissions. Um, that said, I, there are other people like environmental advocates, uh, NGOs, and others who might be more suited for what you're talking about. Thank Anyone you. else on Zoom with another question for David? Um, someone's uh, put in the chat, our country is so divided right now. What do you think will be the best way individuals can help make change? It's a, it's a great question and it's a very hard question to answer. Um, I, I think the simple answer is vote. Um, Stephen, why don't you go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Yes, this is actually a, a previous question presented in the chat from Angie Evans. Can you and the Globe devote a daily column to the climate emergency? And I would actually rephrase that. You know, what what more can the Globe do to raise awareness uh, in in uh, all their uh, reporting? Well, uh, I, as I mentioned uh, at the outset here of uh, the Zoom conversation, the Globe uh, has just expanded its climate team, and we now uh, have an imperative uh, paper-wide to be writing about climate issues. And I mean, you know, just this week, uh, we've had three front page stories, I believe, about climate issues. Um, I wrote a story about the extinction crisis on the front page. Uh, one of my colleagues wrote a front page story about uh, the challenges uh, of getting off natural gas and, and eliminating the use of fossil fuels, which is what our new climate law requires. And a colleague just in today's paper looked at um, what tech companies in, um, in Massachusetts are doing to try to address climate change. So, uh, you know, we, we are writing about it quite regularly. I've been writing about this issue uh, for a decade now, uh, religiously. Um, and you'll see even more coverage uh, in the coming weeks and months, including a spotlight uh, series that will be devoted to climate change. We have time for one more question, if there's anyone on the Zoom community who has a question for David. That might be it. Okay. Um, I know Judy wanted to say thank you. Great. Today. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your questions and uh, for paying attention. Um, that will conclude our presentation for the evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, thank you for supporting the Blue Hills and have a wonderful evening.